Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our panel entitled Technologies for Border Control and Beyond, How to Integrate Privacy and Data Protection. The panel will be chaired by me, and it will be moderated by Professor Ian Brown from the Oxford Internet Institute. And our speakers today are Gabriel Blasch, who is a legal uh, officer at the European Data Protection Supervisor. Then we have uh, Mike, Mike Hudolf, who is from the German Federal Police and who is also in charge of the Smart Borders pilot in Germany. And we have also Angela Sasse, who is a professor of human-centered uh, security at the University College of London. And we have Wilfried Grumman from HP. Now, our panelists today will discuss uh, three questions. Can we move the slides, please? And the next one. The next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, we will have a discussion based on three questions. And before we kick off with this discussion, I will give you a very brief introduction of the topic, the newest developments in the field, and I will familiarize you with some terms that you might not be familiar with, or not all of you. So we have all these new technologies for border control. Um, who, which present a lot of opportunities and innovation, but at the same time, they present a lot of risks. And the question is, how do we operate them in compliance with fundamental rights, such as privacy and data protection and free movement of persons? Um, I will give you an example and introduce one of the terms, automated border control. How many of you have interacted with it, with this technology? Okay, uh, good. So, <laughs> now let me explain it for the rest of you. It's, for example, if you travel outside the Schengen area, when we talk about the European Union, let's say you travel from München to Dubai, and instead of going to a border guard, you go to a gate, or the other term used for this, a kiosk, where you place your passport, and the technology starts retrieving data from your passport and carries out the checks on the passport and on you as a person as required by the Schengen Borders Code, which is our underlying legislation for border control in the European Union. And then you stare at the camera, which takes a picture of you and compares it to the one on the passport of your chip to verify that you are the one who claims uh, that you're the legitimate holder of the, of the passport. So it checks your identity. Um, you can have uh, checks of identity based on your iris or fingerprint. Um, all these are biometric data. And recently, in the latest version of the General Data Protection Regulation, biometric data were formally classified as sensitive data. So we'll see whether that will lead to different conditions on their processing in the European Union. I would like also to mention here that in the European Union we have a clear distinction between two categories of passengers. One of them who enjoy the Union right to free movement, with the broad majority of which is European citizens, and the other category, third country nationals, which are subject to more thorough checks. And for European nationals, there is currently no legal requirement to always verify their biometric data. So we can still avoid it for now. <clears throat> now that I mentioned that there is a separation between third country nationals and EU nationals, I would like to introduce uh, the other term which will be, and the other trend which will be discussed in our panel. And this is the Smart Borders Package, which was proposed three years ago by the Commission and which proposed, it was actually two different proposals, one on the entry exit system and the other one on the registered traveler program. Both proposals were targeted at the third country nationals, at certain groups of them, and each one of them would create, according to the original proposal, a new database with fingerprints and facial images. And the first one would be to control the entries and exits of third country nationals and to detect overstay. 
which would also allow the police to stop people within the countries and check with their fingerprints whether they're over stairs or not. And the other proposal on the registered traveler program would create a separate category of third country nationals, which would be frequent, pre-vetted, pre-cleared travelers and who would enjoy less thorough checks. Now, uh, last September, the French delegation to the European Union proposed extending the scope of the Smart Borders package also to EU nationals. But it hasn't, uh, this proposal hasn't made it to a legal uh, proposal, to a law proposal yet. And the Smart Borders package was recently piloted and we'll hear some results about, uh, from this pilot from Mike later. So if I can quick, uh, kick off with the very first question and if we can change the slide as well. The first question will be, uh, we'll start with a broader discussion. Can we change the slide please? Thank you. So the first question is these new technologies that are more data driven what kind of fundamental rights risks do they pose? Is there, for example, a risk of indirect discrimination between those who enroll themselves in registered traveler programs or decide to use these automated gates? And between the others, uh, meaning will there be a new type of digital divide between these people? Is there such a risk at all? What could be the consequences and the possible solutions? Now, I will give the floor to uh, our panelists and I suggest we start with uh, Gabriel. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much to the organizers for um, inviting me at this very interesting panel. The, uh, the border management um, recently and in the, especially in the latest years become a, a more and a more challenging area in, in and for the European uh, Union. And uh, that that's was also um, a result of um, more proposals which uh, uh, came, for example, the, the, the last um, European Commission proposal was the, the, the border package uh, with the aim to amend the, the Schengen border code and um, uh, replacing basically Frontex with an European border, uh, European border and coast uh, guard. And that shows that increasingly um, we are facing security but also data protection and privacy issues. And um, the, uh, the question, or one of the questions might be how to, to find the, the, the right balance between the right to security and the right to privacy and data protection. Um, of course, some of the, uh, the uh, proposals, such for example the Registered Travelers Program, might raise the question of direct, indirect discrimination but this is not the, the only one. Uh, also, there are also other forms uh, of, uh, or with the aim to accelerate border crossing, such as the um, ABC. Um, um, and here, the, the, the main um, um, uh, nature presented by the, the legislator uh, of, of the form of um, the, the, the passing is the consent of the traveler. And that's, that will be the, the, the ground legitimizing the, uh, the processing of personal data. But of course, defining consent, it's a bit more difficult in practice because consent cannot be considered as being given voluntarily as freely uh, if the only alternative is the long queues or administrative burdens. <coughs> You can help me <laughs> in the explaining uh, more here. And of course, the, uh, the, the goal is to um, eliminate, to prevent the risk of discrimination between, let's say, the, the, um, the, the bona fides travelers and the, the other category, but not be considered as a bona fide uh, travelers. So the idea is um, that the, the, the vast amount of travelers who do not travel uh, frequently enough 
to undergo a registration or, for example, whose uh, fingerprints are not possible to be read or unreadable should not be placed in a category where they can be considered a higher risk uh, category uh, of uh, travelers. So um, the consequence yet will, will be here that there will be um, discrimination between different categories of travelers. I don't know uh, uh, if there are examples in, in practice, for example, in, in Germany. Um, what possible solutions could be uh, provided here? The, the EDPS started to provide the reactions, <laughs> interventions, and formal opinions since to 2000. Uh, uh, and five and six with regard to large IT systems. Uh, uh, it was uh, an opinion of the EDPS uh, on the, the Schengen information system in 2006. Uh, at, at there, for, for example, there was a um, recommendation to the EU legislator to, <coughs> to um, carefully analyze, for example, the transformation of the, the Schengen information system from a reporting system to a reporting and investigative uh, system which, uh, which is now again under the uh, debate. Um, and also we have issued um, an opinion on, on the 2013 um, commission proposals on, on the smart borders package and we, we have continued to, uh, to follow very closely uh, developments within the Council of the European Union and with the Commission. So um, the, the solution is, I think we, we need to come back to, to what I, I said uh, firstly, to find the right balance between the, the need and the right to security and with the need and the right for and with data protection. So I thank you and I would like to pass the floor to yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fully agreeing to you um, regarding your last words. We have to find the right balance. But yeah, what, what is actually in place in, in the EU? There is um, a distinction between two passenger groups, as Diana already mentioned. There is the EU citizen, and then there is third country nationals. And there is a different, um, yeah, different intensity in the border checks for both. Why is it? You need to understand this, uh, why this is in place. There is um, the, the EU citizen, they have every right to enter the European Union and every right to leave the European Union as they want to. This also applies to third country nationals, but the entry conditions for third country nationals in place are different. You have visa-free travelers, which um, yeah, which are basically from countries where no migration issues or migration threats uh, are in place or not that um, hard ones. And then you have the visa travelers, which have, uh, which need to apply for a visa before traveling. So there is a migration pressure from this, um, uh, yeah, from these countries, more or less. And yeah, um, also the, the use of biometrics now. It is, you, you raised the question, Gabriel, um, of what happens if somebody is not able to give his fingerprints. Yeah, this is, this is easy. You're, you're right. If you only rely on, on one uh, biometric um, identifier, like the fingerprints, somewhere you get lost. Also, the same happens with the iris. If uh, somebody's iris cannot be recognized, it also uh, will, will lead you to a point where somebody cannot register. And also with the face images. You can um, have passports with bad uh, digital images inside, which you cannot use for face recognition issues. And for this is why we always state, okay, you need at least two biometric identifiers. If one is not working, you can use the other one. Yeah. So. This is easy to have this in place, and I believe the new um, regulation proposals for smart borders will, yeah, will rely on at least two identifiers. I don't know. This is not, not my task. I'm an end user, more or less, so I'm an exot here today. Um, yeah, but 
in, in general, you, there, there are solutions on that. Um, yeah, is, uh, does RTP create an, an, another, yeah, another passenger group or does this, um, yeah, are, are other travelers more suspicious? This is the, the main question. Uh, basically, no, they are not suspicious more than, than uh, frequent travelers because um, if, you, if you like to register, you will give your written consent Otherwise, it makes no sense. This is what we also did during our Smart Borders project, which I will explain a little bit later. Um, we, we got written consent, so the, the passengers volunteered to participate in the pilot. And also, for the RTP system in place, we have in Germany um, an RTP system in place. Um, the passenger need to volunteer to uh, participate. So. To be honest, border checks in, in the EU, they do not last that long at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I say at the moment because we don't know what will happen in the future um, and, and what additional checks will be implemented or whatever. Um, so is there really long queues for travelers? Did somebody enter the EU uh, yesterday or the day before and had a long queue in the border checks? Okay. Seems not that there is long queues, but you're, you're right. Uh, if, if there is more than one flight arriving, then there could be long queues. And then, yeah, what is the chance? Do I I go in the, in an RTP scheme or not? This is this is the real question. But you you need to um, have your your consent for that. Yeah, and and also. There might be the question of um, of automated border control systems. So I was um, a yeah, sub project leader in the in the German automated border control systems implementation, um, which, which began in 2014. And from my experience, there is uh, the border guards. They don't feel that somebody is more suspicious if he's going to the manual and regular check than. Um, uh, another one who uses an, an RTP system or, or an ABC uh, gate for, for his entry checks. Why is that? There is a lot of people who simply cannot use an, an ABC gate for what reason ever. Miners is difficult to, to process with an ABC gate at the moment, for example, because uh, one of the annexes of the Schengen Borders Code states that you have to take special attention on the, on the travel of miners because there's always the risk that they um, that they are not under parental care or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you have to, to keep a special eye uh, or, or an, an intensive view on this um, children. Or there is people not process, uh, possessing an, an electronic passport. They also cannot use it. So this will, I believe there, there is no suspicion behind this. Okay, so I will pass then. Okay, so I'm going to look at this from the point of view of, of the individuals, the, the people who are traveling, traveling public. Um, and I come, I, I live and work in a country uh, where long queues at the airports are pretty much the norm. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the UK. So, like every, every year again, you'll see, you know, sometimes during the summer, sometimes other times of year, you'll see basically the stories in the news of basically of people sending photographs from Heathrow, you know, of basically queues where it takes two and a half hours to, to, to get through the border, which, um, you know, if you're not regularly traveling to the US, you're kind of not used to that. Um, <coughs> if you regularly travel to the US, you probably already are. Um, but, um, and that also explains, I mean, basically the, I mean, in the UK, certainly there's been very clearly the pressure to accommodate larger numbers of travelers, but without increasing the number of personnel at the border. That's, that's very clearly a part of, you know, the, the framework for, for doing this. So, um, so from that point of view, when their first, the first ever frequent traveler system that was introduced at Heathrow about 10 years ago, uh, 10, 
maybe even 12 years ago, the um, IRIS system, it was for non-EU travelers because um, the um, non-EU travelers basically have to use a separate border check to the UK slash EU EEA nationals, right? And what happened within months was is that a lot of UK and EU citizens were basically banging on the door of the enrollment office at Heathrow and are saying, but I want to use this, right? Um, because they thought, oh, maybe, maybe there is a way, because they, they actually their perception <coughs> was... Yes, it may overall and on average take longer to go through the non-EU queue, but the, rea the, the reality, their lived experience was that you can get stuck in quite long queues at the, um, at the UK, EU, EEA uh, board as well. And they basically going like, you know, if there's any way of trying to get out here faster, I'm going to try it. You know, um, in the event, it worked okay for some people. It didn't work um, quite a lot of times, you know, for all sorts of, like, pedestrian reasons that, that we often don't think about is, you know. So the systems weren't terribly reliable, broke down quite often. So then only out of three, you might only have one gate in operation. Um, it was a terribly user-unfriendly system in the sense, basically, we, uh, uh, people who work in biometrics talk about the iris dance, you know, where, where basically the individual has to position themselves correctly. And if you don't do it very often, it's quite easy to get it wrong, um, essentially. Um, so, so that plus, you know, some really fundamental system design flaws, which in, in, in the new EU passport check goods they have avoided, you know. So basically, if you put two barriers into the system, it's got nothing to do with the biometrics, you know, but basic system design will tell, tell you if you've got a, a, a barrier to go into the booth, then have the bar biometric verification, and you have another barrier to get out. You know, it, it adds a minimum of 30 <coughs> seconds, if not a minute, to the whole throughput to throughput time. It, in, 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 in the rest, we can yeah. dispatch, yeah. but it basically makes them under. So their experience was not so, so, so great, right? So, but I want to basically, also from the whole performance point of view, then, then now shine a light on that. Is it really, is border control and, and what you're experiencing at the border, is it really just about, I mean, that bi biometric verification is about one thing only. And that is to prove this is my passport. I am the person that this passport was issued to. And the overall task of border protection, of course, has an infinitely much larger uh, number of, of tasks to deal with, right? So basically, um, in, you know, in one country, in, in, and, and I'm sure in others as well, is when you're putting the passport down, the fact that, you, that it proves your pass, it's your passport isn't enough. It'll also do a check whether your name is on a watch list, right? And if the gate basically flags you and says, go and see, you need to go and, and have a secondary check by this agent, it's not necessarily <coughs> because the biometrics <coughs> failed, but because, I don't know, four letters in your first name and four letters of your last name match any name that's on a, on a watch list, right? You don't know that, as, as most people don't know that, but that is the case, right? And, and if you think about the complexity of actually what border control faces, you know, it, I think we have to ask some very serious questions. You know, there's all sorts of things like, it's not just in this day and age about, you know, is this your passport and are you entitled to travel? It's, okay, you're going to Turkey, but you're, are you really going on holiday or are you trying to travel on to Syria, right? Where do you come from? Um, you know, in, in the U.S. now, you know, you may be an EU citizen um, if you're from, um, you know, but if you've been to Iran, you know, tough luck. You now need a visa, never mind that you didn't need a visa before. And so with those kind of, because that is, you know, and that is a new requirement that's derived from other border protection tasks, you know, and some of them are very serious, you know. Pa parents, you know, are not supposed to take e their EU children <coughs> Um, and to a country and, and basically force them into marriage, right? That's also a job that border protection people do. And if they want to do those, and they're also trying, you know, they're trying to, to, to not just detect people who are already known to be problematic, they're trying to detect people who have an intent that might undermine security. And for all of those things, there's a whole myriad of data that is being needed. And, and the real question is, 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 you know, of course, if you turn that around, that potentially is very privacy invasive. But is that how do we actually balance that with, with the, the ability of border control people to do all these kind of jobs, to fulfill all these kind of tasks? I think that is actually getting very difficult, and I think it's time that we acknowledge that it's not just about proving that this is my passport. There's a whole 
range of other things. And we need <coughs> to have the debate of how much data we're giving up in that purpose and how can that data be used in the, in the longer run. Yes, um, so I'm here sitting here from uh, industry at Packard Enterprise, maybe just to clarify that we have the uh, lucky position to run the SIS2 system for five years now and the VIS systems in Europe. So that means we are directly involved in, you know, how does these systems are managed on privacy, on security, and, and all these things. There's a third system, as you know, is Eurodac, which is the Asylum Registration System. Um, I wanted to answer the, your question with uh, very focused on what are fundamental right issues. I think the first thing I wanted to say is that if you look at border control, this is one of the best, I think, regulated environments where privacy is taken really seriously and at heart. And I think we have the people here from the Commission be present because if you, if you really careful look at uh, how these systems were conceived, um, you know, all the things, the supervisory model with the uh, uh, EDPS presence, the local data uh, protection authors in every country reviewing the system. You know, Schengen 2 was defined by privacy is guaranteed by default. Their data can be used for its purpose. Detailed procedures exist to uh, really uh, protect the innocence of a person, rec rec the rights to rectify your data, to delete it. Uh, you can ex ask explanations to pass the border. So the first question I wanted to state is that if you look at border control, I think that uh, the homework really was done and is of course done in an exercise, a balanced exercise between privacy regulations and then more today, I think, very actualized security constraints now. So that's the first statement I wanted to make. Um, the second statement I wanted to make is that in a certain way, the uh, technology is here an enabler. Because often people say, you know, in this privacy debate and security debates, is that technology is an enabler of privacy protection. If you look at the VIS systems or the SIS systems, they're completely, completely separated. So the legislative framework does not allow any interchange of these systems unless, really say it, really authorized. And so in a certain way, the, the concept of privacy by design, privacy by default, you know, upfront, you know, these systems conceived like that, and then the continuous supervision on the privacy by design, that, you know, the querying, the analysis of the processes by the DPA, by the EDPS, and so on, is uh, taken very seriously. And then the third uh, question, or point is about, does it create new divisions? You heard about it, there is the, say, the third country nationals, there's the EU ones, Everything there has to be done also by matching, I think, the control requirements with the adequacy requirements and the service level agreements you try to give to your the people who cross the border. And so it is, a, in a certain way, if you look at an RTP system, in fact, you have the option to opt in to register yourself as a traveler to make your traveling easier. So um, I, I think there is a kind of... Uh, concept behind this to make traveling, I think, so as fluent as possible. So these were the fundamental comments I wanted to make, yeah. What we're, what we're going to do is we've got three questions that we've asked each of our, our panelists to consider, but we want to see if there, between each there are any brief comments or direct questions based on what has been said, and then we'll have longer at the end for general discussion to try to make things a little bit more interactive. So would anyone like to on the panel or also in the audience um, come back on any, anything that has been said so far? Okay. If no one I can wait. Yeah, there's one, there's one, one lady down here. Okay. Hi. Um, do you know whether they handle the data differently um, from an EU uh, national versus a non-EU national? So, if, if I am uh, someone from another country and um, they have my data, will they handle it differently than if I am an EU citizen? Mm, yes, they do handle it differently. <coughs> yeah. um, and I will explain you why. There is, um, we have um, a regulation in place, it's the Schengen Borders Code, and the Article 7 of the Schengen Borders Code clearly states how uh, the, the data is processed and it needs to be processed. So for an EU citizen, there is 
basically um, a watch list check, so checking the SIS system. Um, but not on the personal data, um, regular, uh, in, in, in a regular way only the, the document number is checked. And then if you have doubts on the people or, or yeah, on a, on a non, it's how it's stated in the, in the Schengen Borders Code, on a non-systematic base, you can also check EU citizen against the watch list, the SIS system. So for a third country national, um, there is, again, different, a, a different way. So it's an obligation for the border guards to check the, the data of a um, third country national from outside the EU uh, against the SIS systematically. So the, the data will be checked against the SIS, whether you're in the SIS, whether there is entry restrictions in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not a specialist what is all in the SIS, uh, but um, there's, uh, um, yeah, there is the, the things in. And then if you're a visa holder, we are obliged to uh, do a verification with your fingerprints and process the, the visa data against the, the visa information system. And just to see what is your application and to, to make, make it a little bit easier to, to have the, the check on the entry requirements um, an example for that, if you apply for a visa and you uh, go to an embassy of country A and you apply for this visa for tourist reasons, uh, two weeks you will pre uh, you present your hotel booking, you present uh, a flight booking or whatever booking, booking um, related to country A. And after receiving the visa, after getting granted the visa, you just cancel the flights and you cancel the hotel there and decide for what reason ever to travel to can, country B. Then in country B, they will figure out that you cheated during your visa application and will probably refuse you. But this is the, the only difference in, in the data handling. So there is no, at the moment no data storage. All the data is deleted afterwards after the border checks. Um, and that's it, basically. Thanks, Mike. Um, we're going to move on just to um, keep to time. So our second question is sort of focusing in a bit from, from what our speakers have said already. Just, yeah, thank you. Uh, on, on what um, the particular data protection and privacy risks are of biometric technologies and the kind of solutions that we might look, look to. So first I'll ask Gabriel. Thank you. Um, I still, I will keep my head one question also on uh, data quality, that that was related to biometric, but that could also be part of uh, my intervention. So um, what are the risks? I mean, the, the, the first risk um, related to the use of, of uh, fingerprints, <coughs> of uh, biometric identifiers, is uh, data quality. And um, <coughs> For example, um, I was reading um, some of the um, European Commission reports on the uh, visa information um, uh, state of play, uh, and uh, I think the, the, the main problem there is data quality, which differs uh, between the member states when transmitting um, the data to the central uh, system. So that's an issue, I think, still to, to be looked at, especially uh, when taking into account um, either current access of law enforcement authorities to the Eurodac system or to the visa information system or uh, to uh, future systems such as the entry and exit system. And not only from a um, um, political point of view, but also from a technical point of view. So really a question of the quality of the data taken in different circumstances uh, from travelers. So this I consider to be a risk. This risk has been uh, um, uh, addressed and the EDPS has made uh, many recommendations in the past of the use of biometrics. I think we never contested that on the use of fingerprints. It was just to, to warn, to make recommendations on how to be better used in order to uh, um, 
limit the damage that can be done to travelers. If, if we imagine that um, we have a, even a risk of 0.1%, but if we apply at the, the large amount of travelers which are entering and exiting uh, each year the European Union, then at least we will have uh, ten of thousands. So it's still, or could be, uh, a, a great risk for for uh, those people. Uh, also, in the um, the event when they are um, um, matched by a system as uh, as being another person, and when that could happen uh, by by um, searching uh, the database with their fingerprints, then I think that's more difficult to, uh, to deal with uh, and could lead to um, um, repercussions for, for the traveler. Uh, what could be the solutions? I think the solution lies uh, between um, uh, newer technology and I think the state of the art will, will tell us uh, also in the future um, on, on the use of technologies uh, at, at the border, but also in, in building from the beginning um, systems and mechanisms which um, are trying to build ideal systems which are free or uh, zero um, error sum. So um, I think uh, that's, that's the uh, introduction, uh, introduction I would like to, to make it here. I'm looking for, for questions, and I give the floor to Mike. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, you're right. Quality, quality is an issue. Um, this is, um, we see it today by, uh, when we look to the automatic border control systems. There are passports which have a good quality picture in, which is simple to use and, and, and good to use in an automated um, verification scenario. And we have other passports with um, where the, the data quality is, yeah, less than we would have expected, to put it that way. So the, even with this, um, yeah, bad data quality, you have you will manage to have the majority of people processed uh, with the with the um, <coughs> algorithms in place today, but. Um, if it comes to the quality of fingerprints or face image in the visa information system, what could be a, a solution is to, yeah, just to have a an, an quality check when capturing the data in place. And this, if, if um, a regulation is set up, a new regulation uh, like the, the, the EES and uh, RTP, so the smart borders proposals at the moment, you, you should have, uh, you should keep an eye on, on having this quality check algorithms or mechanisms. It doesn't need to be an algorithm, it also can be a, a mechanism that you look manually um, on the data quality in place while capturing the data. Because um, in that way you will assure that you will not uh, match it to the, to the wrong person or you will have only a minimal risk of, of matching um, biometric data to a wrong person. So this is also the case if you use biometric data. data if, if, if there is a discussion how much uh, biometric data should be captured. So the, the decision in the VIS to capture 10 fingerprints was simply based um, on the fact that with 10 fingerprints, if you search a database one to n, so one one set of fingerprint against uh, the all the all the people which are, uh, which biometrics are stored in the VIS that you will get uh, or you will find the right persons. So this is this is really important. But there is um, this, there is also another question um, that yeah ABC. Um, whether ABC uh, require more special data protection um, rules or not. Um, so, so getting back to the, the Schengen Borders Code, which is the legal basis for all the border guards in the Schengen area, I believe 
that we don't have a special data protection risk um, on using ABC because um, yeah, the, the, the uh, so the, the regulation that's in place and clearly states what can be done in the, during the border checks and what is, it, it, yeah, and, and what is not possible. So, is there is there any difference between the border checks? Because the the border guard also can can read all the data from your passport. Is it the optical or the graphical data page? So all the graphic information which is in your passport, like your face picture your first, last name, your date of birth, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, and he is also able to use the data which is stored electronically. Basically, one data group is the same, um, or the data group one in this electronic chip <coughs> contains the same information uh, which, is, which is given on the, on the bio page of the passport. So there is no difference. And then we are coming to to the second uh, or to the to the other data groups, there are in most cases or in, in Europe they are um, specially protected. Even that the border guard cannot um, have access to all this data because there is simply uh, they are secured by extended access control with uh, special certificates and they are not available. So. Uh, for, for in the case of Germany, we, we are able to read the Germans and the, and the, the Czech passport and uh, the fingerprint data and verify the fingerprints. But as long, yeah, as, as long there is no, um, yeah, no, no, no exchange in place, this is no, no real risk. So you just have to rely on the on the um, on the on the picture of the of the passport. So. The, the, the data is, is, is secured in the passports in Europe, but is it secured outside of Europe? I don't know. So from the individual citizen's point of view, is the, the number one in, in the interviews that, that we've done and other colleagues have done, is the number one fear they really have is, is of not being recognized correctly. So that, you know, they're traveling with their own passport, but then the computer says no, right? It's not your passport. Um, and then, you know, because then they feel they're automatically being put, being put under, um, un under suspicion, right? Now, you quoted the 0.01% figure, right, which is the agreed level, but, but that is about the false acceptance rate, right? That's the, the, the agreed um, level of, of, uh, of false matching, so that one in a, I'm getting my one, one in a thousand. One in a thousand people might actually turn up with a passport that's not theirs, but the system basically says, yeah, that's a good enough match of your fingerprint or your face. Law enforcement purpose. Yes, <laughs> but from the individual's point of view, right, is what matters is the false rejection rate, right? That's the number of times the system says, no, it's not you, even though it's a legitimate person presenting the passport. And in a lot of, um, well, I don't know, you, can, you guys can, can correct me, but um, over the years there have been a lot of problems in the sense that for practical operational purposes, the numbers of false rejections are quite often in the double digits. Right? And, and if you're basically operating and you, have a th you, you need to get people through, um, then having to, to do secondary checks on 10% or more of your travelers is starting to become a problem. Right? And that, that has led, and there are documented cases where it's led in the false acceptance, you know, in order to keep the false rejection rate down to, to actually raise the false acceptance rate into the double digits and into the quite high, quite high double digits in some, some cases, which then basically begs the question of how much security are you really, um, are you really getting. And so you wanted to react to that, I can see. Yeah, yeah I, I, I simply wanted to react on that uh, directly because this is why um, automated border control systems are not really automated though. There is always people monitoring what is happening there. And if there is a, in, in the German case uh, of EasyPass, it's the German system, um, th it's the case that the border guard simply can, can overrule the, the system and say, okay, the <coughs> algorithm stated it's not the, not the same person, but he has a view, he has both the live image and the, the image of the passport, and he can just 
um, override the decision so that there is still a smooth traveler flow and that there is no need to have a real close look in the, in the second mm -hmm. inspection or whatever. Okay, but, but I think that, that then still is like, you know, if you, if you ask, you know, the people who are concerned about, about the security checks, you know, that's, I think we, we just have to get, get, get a little bit more real about, and, and I sometimes wonder whether these, you know, super tough 0.01%, you know, that, that for instance, the ICAO um, guidelines are, are really doing more harm than, than, than good, because once you then have an override, you don't really have a systematic check on, you know, how, how good your, your matching is, is anymore. So um, that then the, the next part, what people are really worried about is, is, is misidentified. So, so not being correctly identified is one. The other case is being misidentified. And, um, and that's, that's um, also, we, we've had some, some cases, you know, there were indiv individual cases, but I just would, would like to point out that in the case of fingerprint recognition, it took two very high profile cases to actually get a proper scientific definition of what constitutes a valid fingerprint match, right? And of what constitutes a valid fingerprint match in the electronic domain, because, you know, when politicians often rabbit on about, um, oh, you know, we've used fingerprints for 100 years, we know everything there is to know about fingerprints. You have to go like, no, you know everything that's known about inked, full rolled fingerprints. We actually don't really know what the proper performance is, and we don't really know what the attack resistance is of the digital ones. We are learning on the job as we are doing this, right? And so that also means that people are worried about being misidentified um, and someone. And certainly, I mean, the UK always like being, being a little, you know, often jump making some, some quite ludicrous suggestions here is when they were talking 10 years about, about introducing a biometric database, you know, that as you do the enrollment for the passport, that they would create a biometric database and what they would do is match all fingerprints from uh, unsolved crimes against this new national fingerprint database, you know, as a, that was basically in, in when, when the whole, you know, inconvenience and cost to citizens was raised, they would say, oh, but, you know, we might be able to, to make headway on all these horrible unsolved crimes as well. And you, if you think the whole part of that through is and how easy it is to actually get a misidentification and then who really, dis, you know, basically decides. Um, that I think we should really point out here that, that we are learning on the job, we don't really have very clear guidelines, and I think people are right to be afraid that they might be at the mercy of, of, of some algorithm or some machine saying there is a match and there is not a match, and I think we need to really much more clarification and better guidelines. And of course, I, I would actually welcome the common sense of a human being, you know, such as, as a well-informed, experienced border guard to make the right decision in those cases. I just can confirm what Angela says. First of all, that, uh, you know, biometry systems are, are really popping up. You have to know that it's only the visa system which has the BMS system in Europe for the moment, so the SIS system has today no biometrics as such. So the... Um, the, it should be regulated, you know, and it, and it is regulated like it, it is stated today on answering the, the privacy concerns there. Um, the second thing about biometrics is all about the, 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 the weighting between the, the speed and the accuracy. And so it's all this whole discussion is the 10 fingerprints. If you go for the visa systems, you have the time to do that in your, and you can do that. If you go now to the tests which were done by EU LISA, like in Germany, like in Portugal, like in France, around the Smart Border Initiative where they said it's going to be five fingerprints and it's facial recognition which are the two identifiers which are the fastest one to pass on and to work on. So it's, 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 it's just driven by accuracy and speed and giving that kind of service, uh, service kind uh, of feeling. And so, um, and I, I agree if you look at the studies, fear not to be recognized or misidentified, that's the big state quality identifier uh, which people uh, put the highest. But the thing I would like to add to that is that I think time goes on and goes on very quickly in technology. Identifiers and biometric recognition, you can have it now even very close that we can have it on these kind of devices to be very accurate. Uh, what is going on if you go, what is really happening in the debate about PNR, 
you know, the passenger name registration systems. You know, if you go take flights, you are already facial recognized before you take your flights. So the whole discussion about facial recognition, biometrics, and so on is far beyond border management taking place today. And so I'm just stating that, that it's important to know this balance between speed and accuracy, and at the same time, it should be regulated. And I think that today border management is a, is a very good example where I think this is very strictly correct control. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to just, uh, to, we've taken sl slightly longer than uh, I planned. I'm going to move straight on to the final question here and ask our speakers to be quite concise in answering this one so we still have time for discussion, if that is okay. Um, and so, Gabriel. Can we alternate? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Should we start at the other end? That's a good idea. <laughs> um, who's, who's going to start then? Okay, it's me. So I, I, will, I will first um, give you a, a, a little bit more um, precise uh, view on, the, on what is happening with smart borders and, and what, is, what we tested in, in Germany, it's if I managed to get the, the video playing. I hope there is no sound because it's a little bit boring. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's not working. It's not up on the screen. Do we have a, oh, yeah, a technical well, support person oh, in the room? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's still not. Okay. Oh, okay. It's coming. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's, oh, yes, slide it's got it. Yeah. Slide yeah. it to the other screen. Okay. Wait. Slide oh. it to the right. <laughs> I will. I will start from the beginning because it's easier. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Uh, May I? Yes. So it was working. Yeah, it was. Uh, but, but now you have lost it here. Yeah, just turn it on. Oh, basically. I would really like to turn it on. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Okay, now it's, now it's working. So I have to turn a little bit to, to explain what you see. This is uh, just the situation at the moment at Frankfurt. Um, and you will recognize some of the artists. It's a low-budget movie. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, this is the queues at the moment at Frankfurt. And we had, during the Smart Borders um, project, we had this agency there. And they, um, yeah, they, they just took care about the data protection issues and the declaration of consent. And then you will see there is what happens um, on the first entry. So it's the passport reading and a little bit of an interview. For third, this is for a third country national visa exempt one. Um, it's the passport reading and the watch list check in behind. Um, this is what, what happens today. And then we have this fingerprint enrollment. In this case, it is four fingers and it works quite fast, this is what you stated. Um, eight fingers also is quite fast with this new device, this touchless device, which we tested, if you know how it works. Um, and then you see this is um, taking 10 fingerprints. Um, it, it takes a little bit more time uh, to do. And what we did uh, in the test, we simulated um, a whole entry exit system with the back end simulated backend and did a one-to-end search with the data um, for the border guard just to, to assure that nobody is traveling with two different passports, etc., etc. So, yeah, 10 fingers lasts a little bit. Um, because, why, why we did this? Because we had, um, if the businessman is traveling or business travelers are here, they more often uh, than you might know is they're processing two passports. So one for the, uh, yeah, for the different, um, yeah, countries they travel in. Um, yeah, and then we had face and iris capturing also. So it was three uh, identifiers here, which are stored and then um, this is the, the future process sent from our system via the, the national um, authority to Strasbourg and then all the way back. Um, 
Yeah, and, and yeah, with the two passports, you can manage to, to stay all the year without being detected as an overstayer. So that's why we integrated the one to end search just to find duplications in the, in the system. So, and there will be now um, a, a short difference. So this was the first entry. If somebody stopped it, it was more than two minutes. And this is a subsequent entry. And it's basically also the passport reading <coughs> and then uh, the check of the EES and the duration of stay, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's just the fingerprint verification. It's what, yeah, similar to the process now in place for the, yeah, for the visa holders. You see, there's in the system all the entry and exit data stored. And electronically, we grant the entry and exit stamp. And you see also the file registration of the, of the entry with a very beautiful picture of me. <laughs> so I will not bore you with, anymore with the, with the video because yeah, and yeah, what is the, the, the new IDs behind? <coughs> so we say Smart Borders is a system for third country nationals. Um, is it really necessary to have it? I brought the example with the two passports. So if you travel to, to Israel uh, and to the Arabic countries or whatever, you should have two passports just to, to, yeah, to, to get in the countries. And if a traveler comes to Europe, is possessing two passports, a third country national. He could enter in, the, um, um, in January with his first passport, leaving after three months and <coughs> immediately re-enter with the second passport and the same in the second half of the year without being detected as an overstayer. So this is, yeah, it, it might be for, for, for us, it's, it's not acceptable at the moment, but um, yeah, with the EES, you can, you can have a, yeah. Could, could I just ask you one specific question on that, Mike, because yeah. I think it's an interesting one. What number of travelers are we talking about here? Do you have any figures roughly on no. how many? No, nobody has to, figures does, on that. Does anyone in the room have two passports? One, two, three, yeah, so five yeah. or six people. Um, yeah. so, so frequent travelers, uh, yeah. this is a, they, they do have it a lot of times. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and what is the, the thing behind? What is the, the, the right balance of having biometrics in the system? How long should they be in the system? You saw the difference between the first entry and the subsequent entry. It was almost one minute time difference in the border check. This has a great impact, not for the single person, but if you imagine there is two flights to, to 800, uh, 380 um, Airbus planes arriving, then you have immediately 800 people in the, um, yeah, in the arrivals hall and you have to, to be quick. So it, the longer the data retention period is, um, the, um, the easier and the faster the border check is, will be because you don't need to register anymore. Um, because the one-to-one the, the -one verification is, is faster than the identification search. And yeah, you also need to store more than, than one biometric identifier is what I believe personally, uh, because if one doesn't work, you can just switch to the picture. And a border guard has problems to identify a fingerprint because he, he cannot see it. He's not dactyloscopic specialist. So, but the picture, everybody can compare two pictures. So. And but, I, I, will, I will pass. Okay. Thank you. I, Angela, actually, I would like to ask you a specific question, if it's okay. Yeah. You have maybe my favorite um, paper, academic paper title of all time, Red Eye Blink, Bendy Shuffle, and the Yuck Factor, a user experience <laughs> of biometric airport systems. Do you think we're getting over the yuck factor yet? 
Um, <laughs> so the yuck factor refers to, to the fact that a lot of people dislike, um, and, and of course this is, there's cultural variation, but a lot of people dislike, for instance, the, the US visit system, which takes the fingerprint, um, because you can actually, you can, because every time you, um, you put your fingers down, um, that some lipids, some grease is left behind, and, and that basically accumulates, and it's nicely lit from underneath, you can see it, and so then in people's minds, basically, even though in reality it's no different from, from touching a door handle, you know, in it's warm, you know, but in people's minds, the, the bacteria breed, and, um, and so, and, and, you know, if somebody was talking about the UAE, you know, there's, there's all sorts of these, these varying cultural factors, and uh, what do different cultures dislike different different systems? So, so whilst in the UAE they think iris is fantastic because it means you don't have to remove your your veil. Um, you know, in other countries um, they 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 don't. I mean, so basically, for instance, in Germany um, there is a relatively high um, there's, there's a high percentage of the population that is interested in alternative medicine. And iris diagnostics is a key part of that, and so they, they basically see it as a much higher privacy risk that somebody could diagnose, um, you know, potential an illness they don't know about from this. And so it actually, I think this basically points out this there's there's a real complexity about what people, what of this data people would would regard as private. Uh, which of these things they might not find acceptable for other reasons, you know, such as, um, as the hygiene factor or other things that could be inferred from it. And I would actually predict that this is going to get, get very complex and very interesting because, as you pointed out, we have biometrics on the phone now, so this is not in, 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 in a strictly border controlled regulated way, well, maybe regulated to some extent, but the banks are definitely jumping, jumping on it, you know, sort of like big time because, um, because it's, you know, they're just basically, they're, the visa, the head of Visa or MasterCard was saying, you know, um, that authentication via selfie rather than a pin or password is going to become the, the most common way of doing things. And of course, so you've got different biometric systems, you've got different standards, you've got different kind of, you know, what, is, what quality, you were discussing quality, you know, the quality that's good enough for the selfie for the payment system isn't necessarily good enough for a passport and border. From people's point of view, however, face recognition is face recognition, right? And so that, number one, you know, that could get quite confusing. If they have negative experiences with low quality biometrics, and we've already seen this in some countries, that basically means they don't trust biometrics overall. They don't just see them as, as very reliable. And the other part of this is, um, if you look at sort of a colleague of ours at CMU, basically did studies where they took pictures of Facebook um, and then ran face recognition in the street. So they basically took people, you know, who lived in that area and just did face recognition on the street to see how many people they could recognize just from their Facebook pictures automatically. And they got, I can't remember, but it was a pretty good, a pretty high hit rate. So the more people becoming aware of that, you know, and I still remember even 10 years ago in Germany when I asked people about what about the biometrics in you know, in, 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 in the passport and see, the biggest fear that came up with face recognition was um, I might walk into a shop and I'm just going in there because I'm a bit bored um, and, you know, then, but, but they have my biometrics, they recognize me and then send a message to my phone saying, you know, um, if you, oh, we see you're interested in these dresses and if you buy two of them in the next five minutes, we'll give you 20% off. And that actually, so I think that, basically sort of starts to sketch how complex in people's perception these, these issues really are. Great, thanks. Um, Wilfred, I wonder if you could give us any specific examples of, of technologies that your company or other companies are designing uh, in this area with, with novel privacy by design features. Yeah, so there's this, uh, on the question of the necessity, I think there's a political answer to be given, but it, it's obvious that today the breakthrough about facial recognition uh, uh, situational awareness, um, um, correlation between all kind of what they call the, the social intelligence, which there is on the on the on the Facebooks and so on, is is gigantic. So just a discussion here about border management is just the tip of the iceberg. I can tell you, in a lot of instances, we are involved in secret services and surveillance programs and so on, where you can even not imagine 
what people are doing already today. I mean, if you walk in London, I can assure you that you're followed from, from moment zero to the moment that you get back on the border and that people recognize you know, what you do. So just to say there is, an, we should really be from that perspective, I think, have the, the privacy regulations and I think at the border. So that's for me, the necessity looks to me rather, uh, you know, it's uh, to say it in French, it's incontournable, it will happen. <laughs> And it's just a question that we have, and I think we have to be very respectful, and I wanted to comment on that, on what happens at the borders. I think their legislation is adhered to very strictly uh, on the privacy as such, and I think that should be a message that everybody should really know. Yeah. And, and Gabriel, I, I suppose uh, you know, that leads very naturally to what, what, how will the EDPS um, and, and the national regulators try to enforce some of these rules if, if this is just all, you know, if in effect there's, there's little anyone can do to stop it? Oh, um, well, it's, it's clear that the main recurring issue is necessity and proportionality. Um, it's also clear that the, the legislator, uh, it's also, um, or it might seem now tempted to maximize the collection of huge amounts of of data concerning ordinary people uh, with, with some of this huge amount of data is just to be used just in case for law enforcement purposes at, as it happened with the data retention case, which uh, by the way has been struck by the uh, European Court of Justice, the directive I mean. And in this case we have as also said at the beginning, we have on the one hand the right to security, but on the other hand we have the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, and respect for, for private life and free movement. And um, that means that the collection of data should be done um, to the minimum necessary. And that also... Um, will lead to how the remedies will be provided, for example, uh, by, by the uh, National Data Protection Authorities, by the EDPS at EU level, by both working in supervision coordination uh, groups. So mm -hmm. it, it's not easy to um, regulate the, the need for security, but it also is not easy to enforce the right to privacy and, and data protection. Um, I also, I would like to say that um, the EDPS has always recognized the uh, legitimacy to uh, improve the administration of border crossing. But, however, uh, this should be also uh, done with safeguards, with uh, uh, conditions um, uh, to be put in place with respect to remedies for data subject uh, uh, rights. For, for example, with the introduction of the, the, the future enter and exit uh, system, the, uh, the, the stamping will be abolished. So no more stamps on, on the passports. But with the removal of the stamping, stampings, there will be a new process in place, at, as uh, Mike uh, shown to, to us uh, in, in his very interesting uh, video, where authorities will be in charge on how to control and administer the, the stamps, so the data when you entered and exited the country. But currently, you are the detainer, the owner of those data with your passport in your pocket. So that will be a big change of philosophy between s s switching <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, the ownership, let's say, of the data from the traveler to the public uh, authorities. So if, if this decision will be taken, we are looking forward to, to the uh, commission proposal which will come in, in March uh, soon. We, uh, well, the EDPS uh, recommended um, to, um, to the EU legislator also to think about a transitory uh, period to be applied in order to, to think about all the concerns, all the issues raised also by member states. I think there were a, a lot of discussions also um, within the, the, um, the Council of the European 
uh, union or within the working party on frontiers, it's not easy how, how this system will work. Uh, you need a backup, you, you need uh, many, many technical uh, conditions. So it's, uh, and also, for example, um, I remember um, that um, there, there was a questionnaire circulated with the member states on, on the consequences of the abolition of the, the stampings. And some of the member states were, or the, the, the border guards, um, said, oh, but we will lose the, the, um, the possibility to check in the passport because the passport is usually uh, valid for 10 years. So they have the possibility to check for 10 years looking, uh, looking back the history, the track of the, the traveler. But now they fear they are going to lose that. So there is also, a, 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 or could be a, a consequence from this point of view. So coming back to what we have uh, publicly recommended to the EU legislator, we want strict safeguards uh, for, for um, data protection, and that, that means uh, retention periods in accordance with the purposes, I, I, I say purposes, um, uh, for, of the Schengen border code, uh, and then um, putting in place right and appropriate security standards uh, and also um, a good regulation of uh, um, um, allowing law enforcement authorities access, but that should be done only on solid evidence as the, uh, the European Court of Justice uh, required in, in uh, his judgment. Um, I will Stop here. Great, thanks. Thank you. That's great. Um, so we have five minutes left. Could you could you raise your hand if you would, would like to ask a question or make a, a brief statement, just so I can see how many people we have. So not too many. So that's great. Could I ask you to stick to sort of you know thirty seconds to a minute? Yeah, very briefly. I think that there is one issue that we haven't <coughs> raised, and is the one that is true that the rights are really good on paper, but there is a huge issue if we look at the law in practice. Uh, what I want to say, if we take Aerodac, for example, there is right to information that is very poorly enforced. Uh, there is the possibility for the person that have the data process to ask to make a request, the category 9, and if we look at the number, uh, according to EU visa report, there were 26 requests last year, and half of them in France. So. Uh, uh, if, if we consider that the people in Aerodac are 1,000, this is kind of strange. And it's quite clear that there, is a, that there is a problem in the enforcement of the data protection rights, and we should start to look at how they are for real and not only in paper. Thank you, and we'll, have, we'll give you the, the, the final word. So I would have um, had a question, so I'm Hartmut Arden from the Berlin School of Economics and Law, and I'm from the Department of Police and Security Management. And um, one um, issue is why do security agencies want that? Is that um, part of a major trend to do everything automatically, uh, not to hire additional officers, or is it uh, more to get all the information uh, and to store them and to have all these background checks? So this seems not to be clear for me. Uh, perhaps a little bit clearer in Europe compared to the US where this is not clear. And related to that, what can we do to make that more transparent to the people using that, that are forced to using that, that? I was forced to use that in the US, I was also forced to use that in the UK. Um, and I would really like to know what are they doing with, with this data, how long is it stored, and this is not transparent at all for the moment, even for me as a lawyer it is complicated to know. Okay, so um, Mike, I wonder if you could in 30 seconds, answer the first part of the question, and then Gabriel, perhaps yeah. 30 seconds the second. Okay, why, why, why we uh, try to automate uh, the border checks more and more is we had a growing number of passengers in the last year. Um, you could tackle this um, with hiring more staff, yes, but this is only one part um, or one dimension of it. The second dimension is at an airport, you're you have fixed uh, sizes of the the entry halls and and, and, and yeah so the the, um, <coughs> the infrastructure cannot grow that fast as we can hire border guards so this is this is one of the problems so uh, one solution is to 
to see to to see how to to manage um, the the travelers with the same amount of staff and in the same size. If you if you rebuild um, an airport every yeah every second or or if it grows, then yes, you're right. You can also have more people in, but in general there is no possibilities because you cannot get that uh, police officers that fast as you need them. Thanks, thanks. And Gabriel, on the trans making it more transparent and helping people understand the use of their data. Yes. Um, it seems that in, in case of Eurodac, uh, sometimes it's very difficult because um, it varies from member state to another member state. And, well, um, first, at DDPS, we are not competent to, to check that, of course, but um, I would like to refer to the work of the um, Supervision Coordination Group, which is doing on, on, the, on Eurodac issues of our uh, asylum seekers, and I think the, the situation in, in France, it, it's quite old. I think the, the, the half of the requests have been made in Calais, where there is a very active NGO. Um, and um, I would like to... to um, to um, uh, suggest you also to, to check the, the work done by the, uh, the group. Uh, the results or summaries of the meetings are published on, on the EDPS uh, website. Um, the, the, there were uh, several reports done by the, by the group. On also, there was one, one on data subject rights. Uh, there was another one on the, uh, the state of play of the uh, advanced erasure. Um, procedure, um, but I come back to, to the difficult part of enforcing um, a European rule to uh, different uh, member states to sometimes lack of resources that the uh, data protection authorities have in some member states to, to yeah. Uh, thank you. We can discuss bilaterally. <laughs> I think we're about to be kicked out of the room, so um, thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you um, to all of you for coming and asking questions, and uh, thank you to the FastPass project for sponsoring this event.